Um, a warm welcome. A warm welcome to everyone for today's Applying Ethology webinar. Um, before we start, and uh, I will introduce the speaker um, of today's webinar, uh, I just want to uh, remind you of our housekeeping rules. Uh, when you join or, or doing the presentation, please make sure that your microphone and your camera is off to avoid any disturbance. And if you have any message or any uh, question related to the talk or related to the speaker's uh, biography, uh, feel free to drop that in the chat box and we will ask this after the presentation. It's my, 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 it's my great pleasure today to uh, introduce to you our, our today's speaker, uh, Rebecca Nordquist. She's a biopsychologist uh, working at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Utrecht, uh, at Utrecht University. She's specialized in animal behavior and neuroanatomy and researches on the fundamental behavior, physiology and brain development of many farm animal species, uh, generally from a perspective of uh, animal welfare. Uh, her main research species for that are pigs and chickens. And as you can already see from the title slide, today's talk will deal with chickens and how their rearing conditions affects their cognition and neurobiology. Uh, with this, uh, the stage is yours, Rebecca. I'm looking very much forward to your talk. Uh, thank you for the introduction and thank you for having me uh, to talk today about uh, uh, indeed chicken rearing conditions and uh, some of the research that we've done on the effects of rearing conditions on uh, the cognition and neurobiology of chickens. To start out with, I'm gonna take a few steps back though and talk a little, bit about, a little about why we would want to be doing this in the first place. Um, as uh, Christian mentioned, I work at the uh, behavior and well in the behavior and welfare group within uh, the department of uh, within farm animals at Utrecht University at the veterinary medicine faculty. I'm um, St stumbling on this because we recently changed names uh, as these things go. I actually now work in the uh, uh, Department of uh, Population Health Sciences. Um, and my focus is on animal welfare research. And the idea behind, for me, the reason that I do animal welfare research is because I feel that it's important that we identify welfare issues based on scientific evidence rather than gut feelings. Uh, since uh, entering into the field of welfare research, I've seen too often that um, uh, policies are made and, uh, and new things are implemented based on what we feel probably looks like it might be helpful to an animal without any real scientific evidence to back it up. And when that happens, that can actually make things worse for animals rather than better. So um, I work very much on the fundamental side, so I have no illusions that what I'm doing is immediately going to change uh, uh, at a broad scale the farm animal, uh, farm animal welfare, but I do feel that it's part of a long-term solution, uh, looking at long-term effects of management and breeding practices on individuals. Um, I focus on emotion and cognition and neurobiology, uh, all as parts of uh, animal welfare. And I often get the question, you know, why, why would you want to do that? Why would you want to look at cognition in farm animals? What do we really care if farm animals are smart or not? And maybe, maybe pigs or chickens are actually better off if they're not very smart because then they don't have much, as much difficulty with boredom on the farm. So there are all kinds of, that I think there are three main reasons why we should be interested uh, in looking at emotion and cognition and neurobiology in farm animals specifically. The first is a practical reason. So animals should be able to thrive on farms. We're making farms uh, increasingly complex for them, which is probably a good thing in terms of welfare. Um, things like group housing and uh, for pigs, um, the uh, group housing has often led to the use of um, feeding stations, which the animals have to be able to use themselves. So it's important that they're smart enough to figure out what, uh, uh, how to do these things and that we're not breeding them in a way that's overtaxing them to the point that they can't do that anymore. Um, there's also an ethical aspect. So animals as being animals uh, have an intrinsic value, which means the value of them as 
living beings outside of the uh, of the monetary value that we may place on farm animals or the value as companions that we give to animals. So their intrinsic value in includes things that are like their species specific behaviors and it also includes their cognitive abilities. So if we're changing things through breeding or management processes that, that change their cognitive abilities, that, um, that infringes on their intrinsic value, which is an ethical issue. And finally, um, empathy leading to uh, or understanding more about how farm animals work uh, and how farm animals uh, perceive the world can help us as humans better understand farm animals and that will help us to um, build better farms and to uh, improve the lives of the animals while they're on the farms. Okay, so looking at behavior and neuroanatomy, um, looking at animal welfare specifically, the, the methods that I use um, are learning paradigms and neuroanatomy. So when you look at, a at welfare assessment at an individual level, which is my area of interest, so I look at effects on individual animals rather than farm, um, there are different ways that you can do that. And there are three general ways that I've uh, put here. So you can look at um, physiology, you can look at behavior, or you can look at the brain. You can look at physiology by, for instance, looking at hormone levels, heart rate, respiratory rate, which can all give you some indication of stress. You can look at behaviors, spontaneous behaviors, learned behaviors, pathological behaviors like stereotypies. Or you can look at the brain using different kinds of uh, uh, potential techniques like neuroanatomy, microdialysis, imaging techniques. Um, all of these different kinds of techniques can be put together to look at neuroanatomy in different ways. In this talk, I'm, go um, I'm going to uh, give you some examples of these three. So looking at uh, hormone levels, looking at learned behaviors and cognition, and looking into neuroanatomy. Um, I think this may be a, a relatively broad audience, so I'm not sure how familiar everyone is with, uh, with how chickens generally get to, uh, to be on farms and end up then laying eggs that we then buy. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the chain of how that works in farming, and uh, this is how uh, layer hens are generally housed. Um, we go from egg to egg. So in order to get chicks, obviously, we have to start, they have to come from a chicken. Um, they, they come from breeder chickens, which are housed in, on chicken farms that are uh, with hens and roosters in order to produce fertilized eggs. So the product from a breeder farm is a fertilized egg. These fertilized eggs go to a hatchery where they're incubated. And um, once the chicks hatch uh, at the hatchery, they're sexed because for layers, we only want the hens because the, the roosters don't lay eggs. Um, they're vaccinated and they're transported uh, as one day old hens, um, which is the product of hatchery. They then go to a rearing farm where um, chicks are, uh, are uh, raised uh, until they're 17 weeks old. Um, this is what rearing is. So uh, this is the rearing phase, which is the phase uh, after they've hatched and up until they're 17 weeks old and can lay eggs. So this is going to be the focus of my talk. Um, once they're 17 weeks old, the chickens are transported to a laying farm where they then spend uh, uh, the rest of their adulthood, their egg laying uh, uh, time, um, where they produce eggs for consumption. Um, so this is, this is held for uh, layer hens. Um, broilers have a different, uh, uh, are produced differently and have a different farming schedule. But this is the, my, the focus of my talk today is going to be on layer hens. Rearing is a critical period. Um, so this is the period between hatch and 17 weeks of age. And we all know from all kinds of different studies in all kinds of different animals and from common sense in general, um, that early life experiences are formative for later life. 
Now, rearing, because it's a relatively short period in comparison to the very long period that hens spend on a layer hen farm, rearing is an under-investigated area and also relatively unregulated. Um, so there are very uh, so there are regulations in Europe in terms of how you can house your animals um, after the laying phase, but most of those only start when the hens are 17 weeks old. Before that, there's, for instance, very little regulation on stocking density um, and uh, all kinds of other issues that are regulated later um, are not regulated. At, uh, until they're 17 weeks old. Um, this is a, a sort of a, a, almost a blind spot and it's something that's becoming more investigated. So a number of groups have started to pick this up, but it's really sort of amazing that this is just now starting to be really researched because it's, it, I tell, you know, I say it, it's like starting to look at people when they're in high school and then wondering why you have behavioral issues when you've ignored them. The, uh, until they reach puberty. Um, in today's talk, I'm going to be talking about the effects of housing conditions during rearing on stocking density, uh, housing conditions during rearing. So I'll talk a little about, about stocking density and uh, different uh, effects of stocking density on behavior and corticosterone. Um, and I'll talk about being raised in an aviary versus caged uh, housing. And I'll also talk a little bit about maternal care uh, and some of the studies we've done on the effects of maternal care on neurobiology and on corticosterone. So to start with rearing, uh, rearing conditions and stocking density, as I mentioned, uh, stocking density is um, not really regulated in Europe um, uh, up until 17 weeks of age. Um, and stocking density, whether well, it's a high stocking density, is obviously all relative. So both of these are um, a crowded swimming pool to, during a 2008 heat wave. So obviously, I think one of these is more crowded than the other, um, but it's all relative. Um, so that makes the discussion difficult uh, for uh, working with, uh, with these chicks because um, if there's no regulation, what is... Uh, a high stocking density and what is an acceptable stocking density. So we looked at stocking density in three different uh, conditions, um, uh, in an undercrowding condition, in a conventional crowding condition, and in an overcrowding condition. Um, and the conventional crowding, uh, uh, so just to point this out, the, these pictures are not to scale, so the feeder is the same size in all of these pictures. That just turned out that way. Um, uh, so the undercrowding uh, uh, box is our uh, uh, housing is a lot bigger than the other uh, housing. So the chicks are also all the same size. Um, the conventional crowding was actually pretty difficult to come by what kinds of measurements we should be using for this. Um, we had to call in a bunch of favors with vets because most of the uh, rearing companies um, were uh, reticent to share their numbers with us in terms of um, where how much uh, space they allotted per uh, per chick because it's sort of a, a company um, secret, if you will. Um, it, it's a competitive secret. So, but eventually, this was what we came up with for conventional crowding, what most of the rearers seem to be using. Um, we then used three times more space and three times less space for the undercrowding and the overcrowding conditions. Um, we uh, obviously gave them a little bit more space as they got older. Um, and uh, between uh, so between when they were chicks and when they were 10 weeks old, we looked at um, a number of different behavioral tests. So one of these is the, uh, um, we looked at a social choice test. Uh, here you see a chicken, which is leaving a start box. And it can choose to either uh, go to an area where there are no chicks or go to an area where there are chicks that it knows. Um, we actually changed this later on into a Y maze. In a, uh, a, the first studies that we did, we used a T maze, but we found that the chickens uh, uh, were much less likely to actually leave the start box if they couldn't see where they were going. Um, but here you see this chicken eventually figures it out and, oh, 
there's my people, my chickens. So uh, this is a chicken who approached its conspecifics and stayed with its conspecifics. Um, we also did an open fields uh, test and um, uh, a number of other tests, but this is what I'm going to uh, present here. Um, so looking at the uh, stocking density uh, and the undercrowded chicks crossed more lines in the open fields. So it looks like they're less fearful. So these are the chicks uh, that are in, um, that, are, that have more space within their uh, areas. And they also spend less time with their conspecifics in a choice task. Um, now there are different ways to interpret that. The, the, uh, uh, it could be that they are less sociable, that they have less, uh, <laughs> that they want to spend less time with their conspecifics because they're just less sociable. But it could also be that they um, are less fearful and therefore more explorative. And so they are also uh, uh, more willing to be away from their conspecifics. In this uh, same experiment, we also looked at corticosterone in feathers as a long-term measure of stress. Um, so corticosterone is, uh, is a stress hormone, obviously, that uh, is often looked at as uh, cortisol and corticosterone. Um, usually this is done in either blood or feces or uh, uh, something that tells you something about the acute uh, stress of an animal. We started looking uh, at feathers uh, as a measure of a long-term stressor. So um, uh, the, just like in people where corticosterone is built up in hair and actually in pigs, we've measured it there as well. I'm, I'm sure probably in goats as well, but we haven't tried that yet. But in cows, we also see it in cows. Um, the, uh, uh, the different feathers are replaced during different time periods of the chicken's life. Um, in a very specific order. So the primary flight feathers um, on a wing are replaced in a specific order. So we took uh, feather two and feather eight because we know approximately when they've grown. Um, and we use those feathers uh, to analyze um, uh, corticosterone. And what we see looking at uh, stocking density is if you look at um, the animals at three weeks and look how much corticosterone is in their feathers, Actually, we see increased corticosterone in both the under and overcrowding group in the young animals. Um, whereas we see increased corticosterone only in the uh, overcrowding animals at 10 weeks of age. Now, it's uh, uh, thinking about how to interpret this, looking at the experiment, looking back at the experiment again, I think that the animals that are kept in the undercrowded area, that there may be an interaction here with uh, their, uh, that there was no um, possibility for them to hide or nothing for them to hide under. So the entire um, uh, big area that they were in with relatively few chickens may have actually caused more fear for them or more stress than, an, uh, than conventional housing area or an area with lots of other chicks which it could huddle with. So in very young chick, it may be important to think about not just how many chickens are in there, but if there are not very many chickens in there, that you need to give them something to hide under so that they don't get stressed because of um, being basically in a big open field. Um, so stocking, uh, stocking density is one aspect of housing. We also looked at rearing conditions in terms of uh, caged versus aviary birds. This was in collaboration with the Norwegian Veterinary School, uh, Faye Tamtani, who has now gone off to postdoc through all kinds, <laughs> through various areas in Scandinavia. Uh, was the PhD student who worked on this in Andrew Jansek's lab. Um, the uh, animals that they did experiments with were either raised in an aviary. So you see that on the left where the animals can uh, go to different levels within, uh, within the area and they can walk around on the floor, or they were raised in a cage, um, which and caged battery housing is in many parts of the world still the norm. So um, the important question here is uh, how these animals uh, then turn out if they're raised in these areas, because sometimes um, 
chickens, which are then later housed in aviaries, first come from caged uh, environments. And you can imagine that if an animal which comes from a caged environment is suddenly turned loose in an aviary, that um, it may not know how to deal with three dimensions and how to uh, navigate three dimensional space, which can be very dangerous. It can end up breaking things, um, breaking bones and uh, have all kinds of consequences. It may not be able to navigate the space well. So we wanted to look at um, uh, how this might affect, for instance, their spatial memory. Um, to do that, we looked at a whole board test. This is a video of a whole board test. Um, the chicken is uh, given nine possible places where rewards might be, play uh, be placed, and three of them are actually placed there. Um, we used grapes as rewards. Um, uh, we tried all, all kinds of different things as rewards, and actually chickens will do very well looking for all kinds of rewards. Uh, spaghetti works very well. Um, mealworms are often used. Uh, and we didn't use them in this case because they crawl away. Um, grapes, uh, our chickens seem to enjoy very much and seem to be able to eat very well. Um, although my most recent PhD, uh, Maeva Manet, is working on an experiment, she's actually working on a whole board experiment this week, and apparently her chickens have no interest in, in grapes whatsoever, so she's using something else. <laughs> um, but three out of nine locations are rewarded. Um, uh, and with this test, you can test spatial memory, um, long-term memory, and short-term memory. So the long-term reference memory is if the animal can remember from trial to trial, which three of those uh, uh, things are rewarded, where the three rewards are, because it's always in the same place. Uh, and the short-term memory is if they can remember where they've already been and eaten a grape, or if they go back to the places where they've already been. Uh, and once you have them trained to find those three uh, rewards, you can obviously um, do a reversal and reward three other uh, uh, potential areas and see how long it takes them to figure that out. Um, now, these are the results. And without getting into what all of these big, long graphs mean, uh, the basic conclusion is that being raised in a cage has negative effects on working memory following reversal, which means that these chickens have impaired spatial memory um, following a reversal, so uh, when they need to be able to use behavioral plasticity. Now, that could be uh, potentially averse for them, especially if they have to move from one type of uh, of housing area to another, for instance, moving from a cage into an every area housing. OK, so housing conditions are important. Um, we, uh, this and a couple of other studies from our group have shown housing conditions are important. But what about social input? Where does a chicken learn to be a chicken? Um, in terms of rearing conditions, uh, in general, chickens are raised, raised in age homo homogenous groups, which means that all of the chicks come in uh, as day old chicks and they all leave as 17 week old chicks. So all of them come in at the same time, all of them go out at the same time. And there are very good reasons to do this um, that have to do with mostly biosecurity. So, um, because you don't have chickens going in and out all the time, the risk of bringing in disease is much lower. Um, in terms of pure physical health, that is a very good reason to, uh, to not want to be mixing up ages because that, that really does cause problems. And a sick chicken is obviously also a chicken with poor welfare. But it also means that chickens have no maternal care. So layer chickens basically that, that just doesn't happen. They have no maternal care. And they don't even have older chickens to learn how to be a chicken from. So they are precocial animals. They can, pretty, they can pretty much take care of themselves. But that doesn't mean that they don't learn anything from other chickens or from uh, a mother hen. So um, this is a potential welfare issue for the chickens. But what does maternal care do for chicken cognition and chicken neurobiology? And if uh, having a mother hen in uh, or different ages housed together is such a, a biosecurity issue, are there practically feasible alternatives? 
Um, we looked at maternal behavior in chicks and um, uh, we housed our, our chicks together with these fluffy um, uh, silky hens because uh, layer hen chicks uh, basically don't show maternal care. That is, um, they're uh, basically stuck in the uh, egg laying phase of, uh, of the reproductive cycle and they never switch over to brooding. Um, so if you want to do maternal care studies with chicks, then you have to house them with uh, other kinds of chickens. And silky hens are generally known as broody uh, hens. So, and that, that did work well as foster hens. Um, various authors through the years have found positive effects of maternal care on, for instance, fear behavior and a number of different other kinds of behaviors, which would suggest that maternal care could be positive for the welfare of chickens. Um, these effects are often small and inconsistent, which is sort of surprising considering, you know, it's, it's maternal care. You would expect this to be a huge effect. Um, and indeed, we've done a number of studies with these, uh, with maternal care using, uh, um, silky hens as foster hens, and they do most definitely show maternal care. You know, we see the chicks huddling underneath them. We see the, the, uh, the hens being very protective of them. There does seem to be a real bond there. But we see really very little effect in any of the behavioral tests that we do, both in terms of fear and in terms of cognition. Um, this surprised me, but OK. We had this and thought, OK, this is one thing, but well, there's, there's a lot of evidence that maternal care also changes um, neurobiology and also changes the way that the brain is wired. So what, do, uh, what does maternal care in chicks do uh, with their brains? So does it change? Do we see something in their brains after maternal care? Um, and yes, yes, actually that does. We did see quite, quite striking and strong effects in a couple of different studies. Um, one of them is that we see, we looked at hippocampal cell size, um, which is something you would expect to be related to, for instance, uh, uh, spatial learning tasks. And we see an in, uh, increased lateraliz lateralization in hens raised without a mother hen compared to those raised with a mother hen. And this was in adult animals. So these animals were 50 odd weeks of age when this experiment was conducted and they had only had a mother hen for the first uh, six weeks. So this was a very long-term and long lasting effect. So you do see effects on their brain uh, and their neurobiology, um, uh, which are really impressively long lasting. We also saw increased expression of hypothalamic uh, facetocin in adult hens. And these hens were a little bit younger, but they were still 28 weeks old um, that were raised without a mother hen compared to those raised with a mother hen. Um, so yeah, the, um, uh, uh, the, even though we don't see very strong behavioral effects, we do see that raising hens with chicks changes their neurobiology in a very long and seemingly permanent way. Now, as I said, looking at, uh, um, looking from a more practical point of view, uh, there doesn't really seem to be a, an immediate applicability for looking at, for um, introducing mother hens at, uh, into farms. Um, that is just in terms of biosecurity, not feasible. Um, one of the ways that, that we could at least uh, improve the welfare of chicks which are in farming now is by looking at dark brooders. So dark brooders um, mimic certain aspects of, uh, of maternal care. And this was in collaboration with Annie Prince Schreiber at our house university. Um, she uh, used dark breeders and rear, uh, dark brooders and uh, during the first phases of rearing and looked at the effects of both uh, on both behavioral and uh, uh, and uh, sorry on behavioral and uh, productivity scores and uh, later on I then looked at other aspects of these animals and um, in her dark brooder studies together with uh, with the postdoc there she showed actually very strong effects on feather pecking 
uh, and feather pecking prevention um, uh, compared to animals which hadn't had maternal cares uh, or hadn't had uh, dark brooders. Um, actually, we stopped the experiments early because uh, the, uh, the animals that did not have the dark brooders um, had developed such significant feather pecking that it was just time to stop. And there was very little uh, feather pecking seen in the dark brooder raised animals at that point. Um, she also showed in behavioral tests decreased fearfulness. Um, so this apparently is something that uh, later on in life does have an effect, and in the chicks as well, does have an effect on behavior um, and on improving a very serious issue, uh, feather pecking in chickens. So we looked at the brains from these animals, and um, what we found is that uh, in contrast to um, looking at an actual uh, mother hen, we didn't see any effect of a dark brooder on the hypothalamic phasotocin, which we had uh, also looked at in the, in the maternal hens. Um, we did see an age effect. Uh, so the, uh, the uh, animals that were 16 weeks old showed higher expression than 28 weeks old, which is interesting from a fundamental st standpoint, but we didn't see any effects of, the, uh, of a dark brooder on any of the different parameters that we looked at. We also looked at feather corticosterone, and we also didn't see any effects of the feather corticosterone of um, the dark brooder on feather corticosterone in any of these animals, which, given the behavioral effects, was sort of surprising. Um, at the very least, it shows that the, that the dark brooders are not um, impairing welfare or are not uh, doing uh, bad things for welfare, but it also shows uh, that your various parameters that you're looking at can also um, really show very different things depending upon your research question. So summarizing here, um, looking at housing conditions, uh, undercrowding uh, uh, chickens, uh, our undercrowded chicks showed a lot less fearful behavior. Uh, overcrowding produced an increase in corticosterone at later ages, though undercrowding also produced it at, at younger ages. Our aviary raised birds showed better working memory in reversal than cage reared birds. And in terms of maternal care, inconsistent behavioral results. So we showed basically no effects of uh, maternal care in our group. Um, some other groups have shown inconsistent results. Um, we showed changes in phasotocin levels in adulthood and changes in hippocampus lateralization following maternal care uh, in the brain, in hippocampus. Um, and dark brooders, uh, they may not be enough to mimic the changes in the brain, but they do show important behavioral differences. And to um, wrap up here, uh, welfare and what this uh, welfare and neuroanatomy and behavior, what do they have to do with each other? Well, rearing conditions can affect uh, the neurobiology, cognition, and fear behaviors uh, of chickens. Uh, in various ways, depending upon what kind of uh, rearing condition you're talking about. And the different rearing conditions affect different welfare measures. So the different rearing conditions had effects on, uh, on either the brain, so maternal care specifically, very strongly, um, or on physiology. Crowding had an effect on physiology and, or the behaviors. We found effects of crowding and of uh, uh, rearing conditions on, uh, on behavior. So there's no single measure that's really going to tell you um, what, uh, how, uh, whether your measures or your, um, um, there's no single answer to individual animal welfare here. You need all of to look at all of these different aspects. Um, then I wanted to thank a bunch of people, uh, the people that I work with now at Utrecht University. So Vivian Kordok Janssen, uh, Maeva, Mane, uh, Susie Hewlett, who did a lot of the, the brain uh, experiments, Elise Einstra, Franz Josef van der Stey, and many, many students, and uh, collaborator, collaborators that I've worked with that I showed some of the research from, so Andrew Jensek and uh, Anja Prince Reiber. And that was what I wanted to tell today. Thanks, Rebecca, uh, for, this, for this great and really comprehensive presentation on rearing condition, on how they affect behavior and cognition in, in, in chicken. Um, we are 
open for questions in the chat box. We already have two questions, so I'm just going to straight uh, start straight forward from that. Uh, Janja uh, is asking whether you have validated measurements of the feather corticosterone versus, uh, for example, a comparison with fecal corticosterone metabolites. Um, well, you're measuring different things. We have measured in the same studies we've done. We haven't done fecal yet. We're working on getting the fecal, uh, Vivian gorlick Janssen is actually working on getting the fecal measures to, to run now. Um, but really they just measure different things. You're looking at entirely different time scales. Um, so blood measurements can go up and down in half an hour or um, they, they can go up within 20 minutes and be back down to baseline levels within an hour or two, whereas corticosterone will build up over time. So it really is a, a short-term versus long-term stress measure. Thanks. Um, the second question refers to, oh, there are more coming up. Uh, the second question refers to, uh, or for, comes from Lindsay and uh, is what stimuli do you think are missing from the dark products that the foster hands pro actually provide? Uh, that would lead to this neutral or neural changes. That can be, that's it. <laughs> that can be all kinds of things. And that is like the, 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 that is a very interesting question. I mean, there, I think um, the dark borders can provide a lot of things which are important and in a practical way will improve welfare of animals in, in a more immediate way than we could imagine them with maternal care. But there are so many other aspects to maternal care. Um, among other things, auditory, so the uh, talking back and forth between the hen and the chicks, um, providing uh, uh, cues as to behavior. So the chicks will, will uh, uh, mimic the behavior of, uh, of a mother hen. And obviously the dark brooder can't do that. So there's just so many aspects that, that a living hen will bring into this that, that a chick uh, won't get from a dark brooder. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Berta is uh, first applauding you for a great talk. And she's then asking uh, whether the increased corticosterone in the feathers of the low stocking density birds be caused by them having just more room to explore, play and get excited than birds in a higher stocking densities. That's possible. Um, so I, I imagine she's pointing to corticosterone can also be raised by just exercise, um, uh, just by activity levels. Yeah, that's that's actually another possibility. Yeah, um, not, they do have more room to just run around and be active. Uh, yeah, that's a reasonable suggestion. Yep. Uh, I, I also remember that I think the fear uh, open field test, the the undercrowded ones were the most active ones. Could this be also a confounding factor that they are used to be more active and have oh, yeah. this space to be active? Okay. Yeah, I think that was definitely uh, uh, an aspect there. I mean, the, especially the animals that were raised in much smaller amounts of space. I mean, they, suddenly they were, <laughs> they're, they're in this huge world, um, whereas the, the, the open field was a bit bigger than the, uh, than the space that the animals had in the undercrowded condition. So I think that was absolutely important for that. Great. Uh, Heather is having another question and uh, is also applauding on the great talk uh, and is asking whether uh, there are other cognitive tests you're using to test cognitive differences between chicks and different rearing conditions now or in the future. So do we have planned to use any specific paradigms in the future as well? Uh, well, we've tried a bunch of different ones. I think um, the in terms of cognition, I like the whole board test a lot because it gives you a lot of different uh, uh, kinds of variables within a single test. It's obviously all of these tests are work intensive, so you want to get as much as possible out of them. Um, you know, we also do uh, uh, tea mazes, uh, and we've also done um, looking at uh, foraging versus social behavior, so looking at preference tests using a Y maze. Um, uh, we tried to do cognitive bias with chickens and that did not go well. Um, we just had a lot of trouble getting them to discriminate the visual stimuli and um, that we were using to do the cognitive bias and they just weren't getting it. And maybe it's a question of doing it for longer or doing it differently than what we were doing, but a visual discrimination task did not go well in our hands. <laughs> if, I, if I might. I might uh, add a follow-up. What, what kind of stimuli do you use for the visual discrimination task on the judgment bias? 
we were using light, uh, so light intensity, and we also tried light color. OK. OK, which sounds fairly simple, but yeah. <laughs> okay. you, you would think so. And um, yeah. uh, to be honest, we didn't try this for um, uh, longer than one or two uh, uh, experiments with a few chickens, uh, and then we had enough other things to test. But uh, uh, I think that, that it's something that could be developed further, but we haven't. OK, OK. Uh, Liza is also asking a question, and she's asking on which basis have you selected the fearfulness test you used? Have you used any other fearfulness tests in your studies, like such a uh, tonic immobility test, uh, to validate also the, the results of the fearfulness tests that you used? Um, we didn't use tonic immobility in the test that I'm showing now, but actually uh, Maeva's experiments are, are uh, she's using tonic immobility now. It's, um, you know, there's, you always just sort of select a battery that fits well with the experiments that you're doing at that point. Uh, tonic immobility, and uh, since I was focusing on such young chicks, uh, tonic immobility in very young chicks is tricky. It's also tricky to interpret. Um, it becomes much easier once they're older. And that didn't fit with my research questions. So um, uh, that was you know, one of the reasons why we chose these. And also just because, um, uh, in part because of practical issues that we had uh, uh, setups that could be flexibly made into these things. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Katarina is asking another question on the, on the open field test. Um, you find that undercrowded chickens cross more lines in open field tests. What is your interpretation of this? Uh, she would expect the opposite because there's evidence in other species that animals with less space available show a rebound effect of movement. Uh, that means that they just move more when they have the space to move more. Yeah, I think that that might be um, a question of time. So maybe if the undercrowded chicks had more time to explore uh, uh, and to be not as afraid of the space that they would use it more to run around and have the exercise. I think this was really a fear related thing um, that, that the chicks who were not used to seeing that much space and exploring that much space didn't. Now, if they were more used to, if they were um, uh, sent there, you know, a few times a week, then um, then they might start using that time to explore more. But I think this is a, a standard open field is just too short to see that. OK, thank you. Um, Jen Jun has uh, it's the last question in the text box. So uh, we still have a little bit of time. So feel free to drop your questions. Um, Again, she really enjoyed your talk and agrees that we need behavioral, physiological, and neurobiologic measures to understand all aspects of welfare. But sometimes we are limited in how much we can do in a project. Based on your experience, how would you compare the usefulness of these methods and which measure do you feel that gives more consistent and revealing results if we have to pick and choose? <laughs> That's a tricky one. <laughs> it is a tricky one. Um... I mean, uh, the, the best answer to this is to collaborate and uh, and work in different er with different people who can do different things. I mean, I can't do all of these things by myself either, um, uh, which is you know why I've looked at brains from other people doing it, doing other kinds of work. Um, you know, obviously, uh, behavioral testing is a lot faster than neurobiology, and in that sense, will give you more opportunities to look faster at, uh, at different kinds of behavior. Uh, neurobiology is time intensive. You have to have the expertise. Um, on the other hand, it does give you a lot of very valuable information. I th this is like kill your darling. I, <laughs> um, I think all of these are useful. Um, and it just sort of depends upon what your area of expertise is, what you are most comfortable with. Um, uh, what you should develop in. And I think it's also important to then involve people from other areas and uh, uh, try to collaborate. Sorry, there's no really answer to that. Katharina <laughs> uh, has a, a, another question. Um, how long did you test your chickens in the open field and how many repetitions did you do? Oh, um, uh, that will differ per experiments for the one that I showed. I'm thinking we probably did 
10 minutes and then measured the first five and the second five separately. And we would have done a single exposure at uh, an early age and one towards the end of the experiment. So one at say four or five weeks of age and one at uh, eight or 10 weeks of age. Okay, thanks. So I, I hope this, this answer was sufficient. And uh, to, for the really specific specifics, they'd be in the yeah. papers. Yeah. Um, Laura has another question. Um, uh, she, she mentioned that she may have missed it, but can you share a bit more about the increased AVT in chicks raised without the hand, for example, is the impact of this increase on the brain? Well, AVT is um, very much related to sociability and social uh, behaviors. And we found that in, uh, in the hypothalamus, which is an area that's also related a lot to social behaviors and to interactions. So um, the, the quick and dirty interpretation here would be that, um, that it has to do with their socialization and the, the way that they interact with other animals. Um, obviously, it's, it's, it's one neurotransmitter, and so um, it's hard to say, you know, the animals with this are this way, but that is sort of the, the obvious interpretation that would be, uh, uh, that you would draw there. Okay, thanks. Uh, I have a kind of a follow-up question uh, on, on this uh, myself. Um, you showed some kind of, well, uh, striking differences in the neuroanatomy, uh, depending on whether chicks had maternal care or experienced maternal care or not, but mentioned that they are, if there are behavioral differences, these are often not reliable or the effect is really small and similar things. Um, uh, but that we would might expect some spatial cognitive differences or some differences in the social behavior. So would you expect that we were just looking at all the wrong places until mm -hmm. now or that these neuroanatomy differences mean? do not really manifest in such strong behavioral differences? Well, I think that, you know, my take on the reason that we don't see as much in maternal care is uh, I think that this has to do with the genetics of the animals that we're looking at. Um, so the animals that we're looking at have, have been bred across generations, um, maybe not uh, specifically to thrive uh, in age homo homogenous groups, but that is certainly the effect. They have to be able to deal with that. Um, so I think we have probably... Um, more or less unintentionally bred animals which are um, resilient to lack of maternal care. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why we see very little effects on the behavior. Um, you might see different things if you were to look at uh, red jungle fowl or to look at more, um, uh, uh, you know, less, uh, um, um, not coming up with a word here, but uh, less intensively bred uh, um, uh, chickens. Um, in terms, uh, so I think that, that is part of the reason for the behavior, but I think that that might be uh, the reason that we do see it in the brain. Um, you know, there may be mechanisms in between the brain and behavior, which, which uh, you do see that these changes uh, manifest in the brain, but maybe not in other areas that we're not looking at, which are preventing it from being shown in the behavior. Thank you. Great, thanks. Um, there are no more questions left. Uh, if there are no more questions, I again just can uh, say thank you again. Uh, I think also on behalf of, of the whole audience for this great presentation. And uh, we'll just remind you that our next webinar will be on March 8th uh, and it will be held by Christina Umstetter. Uh, and she will be talking about uh, precision livestock farming and her research on this area. So hopefully see many of you uh, at this uh, at the next webinar as well.